Hey, welcome to my video, a super fast guide to identifying rocks. Take a look at this picture in front of you. This is a metamorphic rock called a stretched pebble conglomerate. And suppose I told you that this metamorphic rock was once actually a deposit of beach cobbles on an energetic ocean beach. And then that ocean beach had formed in response to rifting of the eastern North American continent about 600 million years ago. That would be a pretty major interpretation just from looking at this one rock. But that's the kind of interpretations we can make if we understand how to identify rocks in the field and start to read out their history. So in this video, I want to quickly recap the three major rock types, igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. And then I want to talk about two main rock properties that can be used to distinguish these. That is texture and sedimentary structure. And then I'll finish the video with a classic example of the metamorphic progression of shale, which goes to slate, to phyllite, to schist, and to gneiss. So you probably know that igneous rocks are rocks that grow in a hot magma as it cools. Essentially, minerals start to crystallize as the magma cools, and they're free to grow relatively unrestricted. And because of that freedom to grow with no pressure or restriction, they tend to form into angular and equant mineral shapes that are nicely intergrown in kind of a jigsaw texture. There's no fabric here, and there's no minerals that are preferentially elongated. They tend to be kind of equant in all different directions. The second category is sedimentary rocks. These are deposited in water, and they usually are composed of mineral or rock fragments that have been worked in a river, a lake, or an ocean. Specifically, usually you can see individual sand grains or pebbles within a sedimentary rock. And they'll often have layering where different depositional pulses of sediment came into the water and accumulated as layers of sediment um, under the water. We can often subdivide sedimentary rocks into two categories, clastic or biogenic. Let's take a look at what that means. A clastic sedimentary rock is essentially one that's made of bits of siliclastic rocks, basically other chunks of rock. Um, a great example is shale. Shale is made of many fine-grained clay particles that are deposited in the deep ocean bottom. When you have a shale, individual sedimentary particles are not visible to your eye, but they quite commonly will appear layered and friable, evidence that these tiny clay particles settled perhaps in different depositional events, which then became individual layers of the shale. But essentially, shale looks like this, very friable, homogeneous, dark rock that is layered but does not have individual grains visible to the eye. And that's an example of a clastic rock. So another type of sedimentary rock is a biogenic rock, such as limestone. Limestones are made up of dead organisms, and specifically the shells of those organisms are made from the mineral calcite. So imagine you have a coral reef, you have a lot of dead organisms dying, their shells essentially become sand, and then are solidified into a limestone, which is made of calcite or calcium carbonate. So limestones usually are dull gray or black in color, and they often can be identified by their dull, chalky texture, but not always. Sometimes you'll see visible fossils or crystals within the, within the limestone, but other times not. Limestones can also look very homogeneous and clean, especially if they're fine-grained. Limestones can often be pitted because they're easily dissolved in rainwater, and they also react with hydrochloric acid, producing a vigorous bubbling. So those are some of the ways you can tell a limestone in the field. So the third category of rock is metamorphic. Metamorphic rocks are essentially have started out life as either an igneous or a sedimentary rock, and then have experienced burial and heating, 
often in the context of a continent-continent collision. So specifically in this example, a shale rock might get buried to different depths and undergo progressive metamorphism depending on the temperature and the depth of its burial. As it undergoes this metamorphism, what happens is that minerals literally recrystallize in a solid state. And this is true of all metamorphism. Whatever minerals you start with, bonds begin to be broken. Individual atoms are broken off, and they are reattached in another place. Sometimes that recrystallization can lead to entirely new minerals. Other times it just leads to growth or recrystallization of the same type of mineral. For example, quartz recrystallizing into more quartz. So this is a solid state process. Nothing melts. These minerals just reconfigure in a solid state. Another hallmark of metamorphism is that the bulk composition of the rock stays the same as the starting material, or the protolith. Because nothing is entering or leaving the rock, all the atoms that were there to begin with also are there in the end. They've just recrystallized into something new. A great analogy is baking a cake. You put in eggs, sugar, flour, then you bake it, and that batter turns into something totally different in a cake. But yet, all of the materials, are the ingredients, are the same. So finally, metamorphic rocks are essentially limitless because they depend on the protolith as well as the pressure temperature conditions that the rock reaches. And because we can have an almost limitless nature of or variety of sedimentary protoliths and igneous protoliths, we can have almost any starting material and we can cook it to almost any pressure temperature condition. So really there's a million different recipes to make a metamorphic rock um, and they all are a little bit different, which makes them really, really cool and interesting. But here I'd like to talk to you about three common types of metamorphic rocks that you're gonna see again and again in your career as a geologist. One is called quartzite, okay? Quartzite is essentially metamorphosed sandstone. Now what happens here is that because sandstone is made mostly of quartz, and it turns out that quartz is stable at high temperature and pressure. So as sandstone metamorphoses, the original quartz grains, which are sand grains, recrystallize into new quartz and basically cement the sandstone into a quartzite. A very similar thing happens with limestone. Limestone is a biogenic sedimentary rock where those fossils are made entirely of the mineral calcite. It turns out that calcite is also stable at high pressures and temperatures. So when we metamorphose a limestone, it essentially recrystallizes into more calcite. Often that newly recrystallized calcite in a marble will be larger crystals, it will be more equant crystals. It can often look actually like an igneous texture where all these equant calcite crystals are, are all grown together. And so the final example of metamorphic rocks actually is, is not one rock type, but it's a progression. It's where we might start with a shale, go to a slate, a phyllite, a schist, and a gneiss. Now the difference here is that when you metamorphose shale, those clay grains or clay particles that make it up, they are not stable at high temperature and pressure, and they actually recrystallize to form new minerals. For example, as a shale metamorphoses into a schist, we'll start to grow garnet crystals, which can be seen here in this hand sample of schist. All right, so now you've got a, a sense of the three major rock types. I want to highlight two properties in particular, texture and sedimentary structure. So texture is essentially the difference between an igneous rock that might have equant intergrown crystals and a metamorphic rock that has a fabric, okay? And fabric can take the form of cleavage, foliation, or banding, which you'll see in a second. But essentially, if you see a fabric of elongated minerals that are oriented in the same direction or appear layered, 
that's usually a telltale sign of a metamorphic rock. Because those minerals have recrystallized under pressure and have grown into these elongate shapes. It's important to always distinguish that fabric from a sedimentary structure. For example, some sedimentary rocks that have layering can look like a metamorphic fabric. But you might be able to tell that it's actually a sedimentary rock if you can see any kind of granular grains or any kind of rounded grains that would suggest it's actually a sedimentary rock. So two common metamorphic rocks, fabrics, are slaty cleavage, which you're very familiar with. And that happens when these planar surfaces begin to form by mineral regrowth. And another fabric is called foliation. That's also a linear arrangement of mineral grains which start to develop during recrystallization or rotation of minerals during metamorphism. For example, let's take this, this granite that has an equant intergrown texture. We'll put it, we'll squish it with some pressure, add some temperature. Those minerals will rotate and recrystallize, and this now acquires a metamorphic foliation in which the minerals are elongated and we're starting to see some colored banding. All right, let's close out this video now and talk about the most classic metamorphic progression, which is the idea of taking a sedimentary shale and running it up the pressure temperature scale to turn it into slate, phyllite, schist, and ultimately gneiss. And we've described this a couple times already, so I'll go quickly. But as you start to cook a, a shale at higher pressures and temperatures, the first thing that happens is you develop that slaty cleavage, and that's called a slate. As you go to higher pressures and temperatures, you start to actually grow a lot of new minerals and you acquire a sheen, kind of a wavy, very reflective sheen. And that's very typical of a phyllite. However, in a phyllite, you typically cannot identify individual minerals with the naked eye. It just kind of starts to get this reflective sheen in this kind of pastry-like texture. One step further in pressure temperature, and we're gonna make a schist. You can categorize it as a schist because it's acquired a very well-developed foliation, which is usually the result of the growth of large platy minerals like biotite and muscovite, the sheet silicates, if you will. And often with a schist, we'll start to develop large minerals embedded in this fabric, things like garnet and andalusite. So if you look closely at this picture, you'll see the, the reflective platy biotites but you'll also see the occasional red garnet crystal that's grown within that fabric. And then finally, at the highest level of pressure temperature, we make what's called a gneiss. This is the last level of metamorphic rock before the rock melts entirely. And it is characterized by mineral banding. Recrystallization has been so complete and thorough that we usually only have a couple different uh, main mineral types. Um, all of these platy biotites and muscovites have destabilized, and they have now turned into things like feldspar and pyroxene, which are stable at the highest temperature. And those feldspars and pyroxenes have segregated into these dark and light bands, which are entirely diagnostic of a nice. So in summary, metamorphic rocks can originate as either a sedimentary or an igneous protolith. Some classic metamorphic examples are sandstone, in which quartz is recrystallized to make quartzite, and limestone, in which calcite is recrystallized to make marble. Shale is a quite different example. Because the clay minerals are unstable, when shale undergoes a metamorphic progression, it starts to grow a variety of new minerals and progresses from a slate to a phyllite to a schist to a gneiss. Metamorphic rocks can often be identified by fabrics such as cleavage or foliation or banding. 
and those need to be distinguished from sedimentary layering. Thanks a lot for listening, and I'll leave you with these concept questions. Have a great day, and good luck identifying those rocks.